it's uh, always very interesting coming to, the, to um, these conferences and um, hearing different perspectives on ag agriculture. I was a dairy farmer all my life, so it's a little bit different. Listening, talking about vegetables and that, even though I'll explain in a minute, I've had a little bit of experience in the last couple of years. So um, one of the things that um, has come through in the, in the presentations all day today um, is, a, is um, you know, about seeking help if you need help, um, communicating with your, with your industry. That's a, another theme that's come through. Um, and one really important thing, and these conferences always bring that out, is staying connected. Um, staying connected with your industry and with your support network. And there's some of the things that I'll talk about today. Uh, um, I talk about my story. Um, I'll share my story. So first up, I just got to um, put a bit of a disclaimer out. So some of the stuff that I talk about is fairly challenging. Um, and so if you do feel uncomfortable, anything that I do say, um, I'm quite happy for you to stand up and walk out of the room. But one thing I ask is if you do do that, as you walk out of the room, just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If you're just going out to the toilet, that's all good. But if you are feeling a bit uncomfortable, a bit stressed, give me the thumbs down and maybe Ian will come out and, and have a chat. Make sure that you're okay. Um, firstly, I just want to expl um, share with you my mission. Um, about six years ago, I became a speaker, um, a mental health advocate um, after of my farming career, <laughs> or the farming career co continued, but in between, like uh, I mixed and matched until I actually become a full-time speaker. Um, and my mission is about creating awareness and education around mental health and wellbeing, particularly in rural and regional communities, because that's where I come from. I come from a small country town in northern Victoria. Um, that's where I farmed. And so I understand um, the effects that that you know, poor mental health and well-being has in a community. Um, secondly, my uh, second part of my mission is about inspiring conversations. Obviously, coming along to a conference like this where you want to learn a lot about your industry, one of the things that you probably didn't expect to come and listen to is a mental health talk. But that's what I'm here for, is to inspire those conversations. So that's the second part of my mission. The third part is to empower people to seek help and seek help in, a, in an environment that's safe and free from stigma. So that's my mission and, that, and that's what I'm on. Um, and I've been on for the last six years. Um, one of the things that, the common thread that was, that was happening through the presentations today was about looking after your soil, looking after your markets, looking after your, you know, your, your crops and all those things, what I'm going to talk about today is looking after your most important asset on your farm, and that's you. I want to make sure that you're looking after yourself, okay? It's really important that we look after ourselves because we are the most important asset to our business, whether you like it or not. How many people in the room are actually farmers here or growers? So there's a few. That's good, so I'll have to explain. Um, a little bit about the unbreakable farmer in a minute. My story that I'm going to share is lived. It's my lived experience. It's not your experience, it's mine. But hopefully that some of the parts of my, my, um, my journey will resonate with you and hopefully you'll take something away from my talk. As I said, some of the parts can be con confronting um, and, and I'm, don't shy away from that. It's really important that you know I talk about this stuff. To, to fulfill that mission that I'm on about inspiring conversations. So the bit about the unbreakable farmer, um, it didn't really start out as the unbreakable farmer. Was, I did a speaker course. I was on this journey trying to find out my identity, um, my purpose after losing my farm. I really wanted to know who I was and what purpose I had in life. Sure, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father of five, you know, I'm a mate, you know, I'm a brother. I'm all those things, but I wanted to find out what my purpose was because I always thought I was just going to be a farmer. I did this speaker course and part of that course was um, standing up in front of a group of people that I didn't know and sharing your story and sharing you know, what I thought was going to be the story that I was going to share. And it was about resilience, persistence and determination, about the things that 
you know, I felt were important about my farming journey. I didn't have the courage at that stage to actually talk about my mental health journey. That was something that I never talked about. And it was only until I started sharing more and more of that that I'd become more comfortable about sharing my mental health journey. So standing up at the front of this, um, this room that day, there was 20 other people doing the course. We had to tick two boxes to make that, that exercise successful. One, we ha it had to come from your heart. You had to share a story from your heart, which was really easy for me because I was talking about my story. The other 19 people doing the course were like IT experts and business owners and all they were doing the speaker course for was to articulate, to learn how to articulate their business better. So for me, doing it from the heart was easy. The second part was a bit more difficult and that was we had to make someone cry in the audience. So it was a real challenge. So I stood up and shared my story. Yeah, it come from the heart, tick that box, and two of the ladies in the audience cried, so I ticked that box too. So I was away to a flyer, but the next part of the day was all about coming up with a superhero name. Sounds a bit wankerish, I suppose, but a superhero name. But we had to come up with a superhero name. And as we were going to the coffee break, after sharing my story, a guy, guy came up to me and he said, you know, the next exercise about superhero names, I know what your superhero name is. You're the unbreakable farmer. And I thought, hmm, that sounds catchy. I might go with that one. So I went to GoDaddy on my computer and looked up the domain name. The unbreakable farmer was free, so I registered it then. That's how I become the unbreakable farmer. My story is more about being broken than being unbreakable. And after a while, I, I got going, I got onto the speaker circuit, I thought I'd better be a bit more professional, I'd better come up with a logo. So I, I Facebook messaged my best mate from school, who's a graphic designer, and I said, listen, I've got a gig on Friday, this is Wednesday night, mind you. I've got a gig on Friday and I want a logo. He goes, oh, what are you talking about? And I, or what do you call yourself? And I said, call myself the Unbreakable Farmer, and he just, yeah the laughter, I could imagine the laughter that was coming back through the messages, he was just, he just thought I was a tosser really. And he, uh, he said, look, what are you talking about? I said, look, resilience, persistence and determination, that's what I'm going to talk about and, I, um, and I'm going to dabble a little bit in talking about mental health. He goes, fine, leave it with me. 20 min minutes later, he come back with this and I thought, yeah, well, he was a bit cleverer than I gave him credit for. <coughs> Um, the only thing he stuffed up is I was a dairy farmer and he put wheat on my, my logo. <laughs> <coughs> never, had a, never had a windmill on any of my farms. So, but other than that, he did a really good job. And it wasn't until I stood up in front of this logo a few times that I realised how clever he was. And it was the farmer standing up there. Looks like he's had a bit of a tough day, but he's got the black dog right at his heels. So it was really, he was really cle more, more clever than I thought he was. So that's how the Unbreakable Farm was born. As I said, my story is more about being broken than being unbreakable. So my story, I grew up in Melbourne. I was actually a city boy. At the age of 15, mum and dad decided that they wanted to become farmers. We moved to the Golden Valley, um, to a little town called Merrigan, and dad bought a small dairy farm. He was a butcher by trade, but always harboured this childhood dream, I suppose, of becoming a farmer. And that's what he wanted to do. So we bought this farm, we moved. For me, it was like a rebirth. So at, growing up in Melbourne, being a son of a small business owner, we moved around a little bit. And one of the things I learnt from this speaker course and unpacking my story is I really never had a connection to community. I was always the new kid on the block and I always was the odd man out, okay? So I learnt that community was really important. It's one of the lessons that I've learnt. Um, so moving, uh, moving to the country was a way of maybe connecting to a new community. The other thing is I struggled at school being that new kid on the block going to new different schools. Um, so I wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed at school, but I always struggled because of that reason. And it wasn't until I got to high school um, that my mum and dad decided to send me to a, a private boys' school a Catholic school, um, Catholic boys' school in our suburb in Melbourne. But I was the only kid from my primary school that ended up there, so I lost all my friends again, all the friends that I'd built up over a couple of years at this primary school. 
and I started off again. And it started that day, that first day at that school, the bullying started. Um, I was about as tall as what I am now in year seven. I had a slightly better haircut than what I've got now, now though. And as I walked into the quadrangle that day, there was a thousand kids in that, in that quadrangle and, you know, there was a St Pat's kids here and a St Paul's kids here and a St John's and a St Joe's and all these kids were standing there, friendship groups, and there was just me. And that, that abuse, that um, verbal abuse started straight away. And over the three years I was at that school, it became physical by the end. Um, and it had a really major impact on my well-being, on my mental health and also on, on, my, on my education. So I went from a straight A student in year seven to failing school in year nine. So moving away from Melbourne was a good thing and moving to the country was even better because I kind of liked farming. We had friends in Gippsland that were farmers. I thought farming was great. I thought farming was all about motorbikes and tractors. That's what I thought farming was about. Couldn't be any further from the truth now. I don't like tractors that much and I really don't like motorbikes because they don't go that often, so I don't like fixing them. Give me a cow, I can fix that any time of the day, but motors I'm not that good at. So um, that started, um, I suppose, moving to the country started my, my farming journey. But one of the underlying parts of my story is that I didn't do anything about what happened to me as a kid. I never spoke out about it. I didn't talk to mum and dad about it. I just thought, that's part of life. So I got swept under the carpet. And when we moved to the country, it was really good. You know, I fitted in well. First experience was a school bus ride, like for school. That was like jumping on a bus with 30 friends, all smiling, all happy. It's all really good. I walked into that school that day. I had eight weeks in that school year to turn my schooling around and, and pass year nine. And I thought, yeah, I'll be able to do this. So I walked into Kyabram High School that first day, full of confidence. I just met two blokes who met me on the bus, off, you know, met me as I got off the bus. One of them's the guy that did my logo, become a lifelong friend. And I walked into class with these two guys beside me and I thought, righto, head down, bum up, I'm gonna pass year nine, I've got eight weeks to do it. I sat down, I looked across the room. What do you reckon was in this room? something I hadn't experienced for the last three years. Yeah. Girls. <laughs> I looked across the room, there was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl across the room. Moral to that story is I failed year nine. <laughs> so moving into year 10, the principal's um, wisdom put me to year 10, said, listen, you know, um, you'll be fine. We'll just put you up. We understand that you've moved around. Um, we'll see how you go. Well, it wasn't long into that school year, the principal called mum and dad into the office and said, look, this is um, not working. I think he needs to take up a trade. It was right at that minute that I knew my principal wasn't really good at his job because if he had to come to my woodwork or metalwork classes, would have understood that trade, uh, trade wasn't going to be my thing. But as I walked out of that room with mum, I said to her, I know what I want to be, I want to be a farmer. And she said, no. And I said, yes. And she said, well, all right, if you can find a job that will give you an apprenticeship, you can go and do it. So after the next three weeks after school, I jump on my motorbike. In the Goulburn Valley, everything's like in square miles, so I do a square mile each night, going and see all the dairy farmer owners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, after about two and a half weeks, I found a job. Luckily for me, it was with one of the best farmers in the district. And... Um, he said to me, look, I've got a job here for you. We'll see how you go. I'll put you on full time after Christmas. Um, but, if you stick, um, but if you stick with me, I'll teach you everything you, you, that you need to know. And I said, yeah, but mum wants me to get an apprenticeship. I said, no. He said, no, I can't do that. I don't, can't afford you to be away from the farm, but I'll teach you everything I need, you need to know. So I went and sold that to mum and started work there the next week. Now, our friends that were dairy farmers armed me with two pieces of advice. They were, to be a good farmhand, I always had to look busy and I had to show initiative. So they were the two things that were buzzing around in my head. My boss kind of let me to my own devices that first morning. We finished milking the cows. He said, you go and feed the hay, I'll go home and have breakfast and I'll meet you back here at the shed and then we'll do the whole farm tour and all that. Well, I fed the hay out, got back to the shed, he's not there. So I thought, what can I do? Look busy, show initiative. So I went and grabbed a shovel and I thought, I'll chip thistles. 
chipping thistles is showing initiative, I thought. So I went out into this front paddy. It was about as big as this room. And up in the far corner, there was this whopping big thistle. The paddock was full of them, but that was a big one. And I knew he had to drive past and then up to the dairy to come back to me. So I went down to this thistle and I went back with my shovel and I chopped it. Directly underneath that, th that thistle was the two-inch water delivery line to the farm. <laughs> now I've sliced straight through it. So as I said, he was going to teach me everything I needed to know. That day I learnt to be a plumber. <laughs> I learnt to be a plumber, a welder. I could grow grass, I could fix cows, I could pull a tractor apart and put it back together. I could do all those things. So he did teach me everything I needed to know. But when I got um, to the age of 22, I'd been there five and a half years. I just got engaged to the, one of the best things about moving to the country was, what was my girlfriend, who then became my wife and still my wife today. So that's a good thing. So that was a positive. We we're about, we just got engaged and we were going to get married the next year. We thought, we'll go out on our own. And me being the cocky 22-year-old thought, yeah, I do know everything I need to know, so let's do it. So we looked at our options and nothing really um, stood out to us. Share farming didn't look like it was going to be my go. Lease, there wasn't too many properties to lease, but 200 acres come up next door to mum and dad's farm. So we bought that um, and joined it together and created a family business. Now that family business ran into a few troubles pretty early on and the first one was a flood. And I know like up here in Queensland and, not in, and through New South Wales, like floods have been on the radar all the time. But for us, this flood wasn't expected. We were a long way from rivers. Um, we're in an irrigation area and we're a long way from anywhere. But it was just a perfect storm that the rivers were full. Um, they had a massive rain event in the hills and it all just... They shut the um, floodgates off into the river and all just backed up the drainage system until it got to my farm and it spilled over and turned my farm into a swimming pool. That was a fairly isolated event, um, but we were underwater for about four weeks. And so anyone that's experienced a flood, and I can tell by the oohs and ahs, once something's been underwater for about four weeks, there's not much left when it all goes away. So we basically had to start from scratch, which was a positive because we had got all new pasture. That was a positive. And the positives that come out of it was the, the, um, you know, the, the lessons that I got taught about overcoming adversity and, and how to you know, deal with the challenges that were thrown at me over that period, like feeding you know, 250 50 cows on a roadside and all those sort of things. That, and where did I get my food? you know, my food for my cows from because it was the 4th of October, everything was, you know, cows were hitting peak production, all our hay was ready to be cut. It was just a, sh a really bad time. But we overcome it. But one of the things that happened is all that stuff that happened to me as a kid all got triggered by this event because it was so stressful. And that's what I call the start of my mental health journey. It was just a spiral above my head. Nothing really much to write home about, but it was there. I just wasn't quite um, coping with things the way I should. The next thing that happened a couple of years after that, as we got on our feet, we had a family bust up on the farm. So um, mum and dad and my vision of the farm went in to two totally different um, directions. And um, the only way I could see out of that situation, being a bloke, one, and a farmer, two, like being really solutions-based, was to buy them out. I bought them out and I took on a lot of debt to do that, to buy them out of the farm. But it resolved the family issue because I had to do that because family is my number one value. My wife and I set out on a two-year plan, a 10-year, two-year plan, it ended up only two years, but 10-year plan of how we were going to, you know, negate this, get our debt paid off and, and build our business to the dream that we had. Two years after that, the drought came. And the drought started, our plan was really robust, so we thought, you know, this is going to work, and we worked through it for the first 12 months, moved into the second year, and it wasn't too bad, but being in an irrigation area, our, our water um, allocation was a lot lower, feed was getting tighter, a lot of the orchardists in the area were starting to push the price of water up because they had to water their trees, and it was getting really dire. Moving into the third year was when this picture was taken. It was taken about July um, of that year or the end of July. Normally, we'd have green grass everywhere 
Um, we had no grass. My cows started to calve. You can see that girl laying up in the corner there. She was the first cow to calve that year. And her calf standing behind her. The cows were getting totally hand fed. And we were um, paying lots of money to keep them alive. That cow never got up. And that's when it started to really hit me. So the family bust up really accentuated my mental health um, spiral out of control um, because, you know, family was my number one value. But once we got to this stage of the drought, I was in a really dark place. I was spiralling out of control and when cows that I, that was, I was entrusted in looking after were starting not to get up and starting to die, I was starting to feel a lot of guilt and shame that I wasn't doing my job properly. Luckily for me, I had an outlet, and that was footy. I'm an AFL football nut. And I was playing footy. I was actually coaching footy. And one day, one day, um, I um, was running across the ground, playing against a team full of my mates, including my best mate, my, um, my best man in my wedding, who happens to be a hairdresser. So you can imagine the banter going backwards and forwards. But he said something to me. I chased him across that footy field, and I punched him. And I king hit him and I knocked him out. I right, knew right there and then that I was in a bad spot, even if I hadn't have realised it before. And it wasn't because I had 20 blokes on my back trying to punch the hell out of me and my best mates laying on the ground in front of me. It's just that I'd got to that. That was my outlet. That was my safe space. And I'd just gone and hit someone who was really dear to me. So that was my spiral out of control. And not long after that, I got to a, a really, really dark place because the drought continued. We were losing money. I, as I said, I was feeling a lot of um, guilt and shame. Um, and I'd started to isolate myself. I'd stopped engaging in my community. I stopped being on the school council. I stopped playing footy. And I just spiralled out of control. And I got to a stage where I thought the world would be better off without me. And that dark afternoon and I call that time in my life my two feet of perspective um, that's what I thought my family my friends would be better off without me luckily for me I've, I've got the opportunity to still be here and share my story but I call it my two feet of perspective because at that moment that moment where you know I thought ending my life was the best option my whole life flashed before my eyes my whole life um, was just there in front of me. And it changed my whole outlook on life. Um, you know, we, we t a lot of, there's been a lot of talk in the, the room today about, you know, your business and your soil and looking after everything, but I wasn't looking after myself. I didn't look after my own mental health or anything like that. It was all about trying to keep the farm going because if that was going all right, everything else was going all right. But it wasn't, it was falling apart. Laying on my floor in my dairy that afternoon, looking up at the ceiling, thinking, what the hell's happened? How have I got to this place? Life gave me two choices. I could either, you know, continue to be bitter and twisted, um, you know, and spiral out of control and, and not fix the problem, or I could choose to become better. And I chose to become better that afternoon. And I picked myself up off the floor, um, dusted myself off, and I went home went home after milking, and that was the end of that. Two months after that, um, unfortunately, things had just got that dire. We ended up walking off our farm. We couldn't sell it. It was in the middle of the drought. Our only asset was our cows, so we sold them, and we basically walked off the farm. The biggest challenge that I've ever faced in my life was the day that I walked off that farm. Because symbolically, as I walked out the front gate, I unclipped my identity off me and I hooked it on the front gate because that's who I thought I was. I thought I was Warren the farmer. Not anything else, I was Warren the farmer. And setting out on that journey then from that day forward, trying to find out who I am, what my identity is and what my purpose is, has been um, an ongoing journey. And it leads me to where I am here today sharing my story with you and hopefully my story resonating with you um, or inspiring you to have a conversation with someone if you are struggling or if you know someone that's struggling to have that conversation with them. 
There's some things that I've learned along the way and it's about, you know, we talk about resilience and I know a lot of farmers hate being called resilient. I know I did. Because sometimes resilience just means there's a lack of other options and you've just got to keep going. And that's where I was at. There's a lack of other options. I had to keep going. And that keeping going, I kind of um, use the analogy of bungee jumping. Because the most important thing in bungee jumping is the cord. If you don't look after the cord, eventually you don't bounce back. So some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about now is about how we can maintain our own bungee cord so we do bounce back when, when we face challenges. So how can you help somebody? Not yourself, someone. So if you know someone who's struggling, how can you help them? So there's a three, three really important things that we can do. We can open up the conversation with them. We can listen and support and we can encourage them to seek help. How do you open up that conversation? It's a tough conversation. I know I've had it with some of my mates. It's a really tough conversation to have. But we just need to be empathetic. We don't have to understand exactly what's going on. But as long as we're empathetic, we can put ourselves in their shoes and kind of travel a little bit of their journey with them. Ask open-ended questions. So not being derogatory to any mental health campaign anywhere in Australia, but if I ask you if you're okay, what are you going to tell me? Everyone's going to say, yep, I'm all right. Or, yep, I'm okay. So we need to ask open-ended questions, questions that aren't just going to get us a yes or no answer. So now I've noticed you've been doing this a little bit different. How come you're doing that? Or, you know, you've turned up to a, this event every year, but you're not here this year. Why aren't you here this year? Or simple questions like that that just don't require a yes or a no answer, but start inspiring that conversation. You need to give the person your undivided attention. Um, you know, don't just flippantly ask that question and not expect to, you know, have the responsibility of being there and give them your attention. Remain non-judgmental. It's really important that we don't judge people how they're struggling because each and every one of us are travelling a journey. None of us know what, it's, what that person's journey is and how, you know, one person's journey affects them differently to you. And we don't need to rush in with advice. You know, you don't have to have all the answers. Sometimes you just got to sit there. Listening and supporting, we just got to listen quietly. Sometimes you don't have to say anything, just sitting there is all you need to do. You don't have to listen. You don't have to say anything, you just have to listen. Demonstrate genuine care. You know, don't just be that person that just asks the questions but doesn't, you know, you know, doesn't really care what the answer is. And build rapport. Sometimes these conversations take more than, you know, one sit down, one talk. You might have to ask a number of times. It might be over a couple of weeks. And then you need to encourage them to, to seek support. And there's plenty of support. There's resources out there. Um, you know, your support networks that are around, professional services. Um, but one really important thing, if you're really concerned about someone, you know, don't be ever scared about in call, by, by calling the emergency services because that's really important. If you think someone's life is in danger, I'd rather be the person that called up the emergency services than the outcome that could have been if you didn't. Um, and don't forget, once you start this conversation, to check in. So I just want to move on now to try and wind this up, um, and that's the three A's of how to look after yourself. There's a couple of important things I want you to take away from, from this part. Because, as I said, we've heard about looking after your farm, looking after um, your soil, your plants, your markets. But this is about looking after you. And the simple, some simple things that you can do to look after yourself. And the three A's are, firstly, awareness. We need to understand and be aware of our emotions, especially us blokes in the room. You know, and identify them, not so much control them, but understand what those emotions do to you, anger and, you know, sadness and all those things, understand what triggers them and how you can control them. Check in with yourself. You know, have that conversation with yourself. Understand, you know, what's going on. Have a bit of a chat to yourself and, you know, do I need to go and seek help or do I need to go and chat to a mate? 
and check in with others. In the middle of the drought, the, one, the people that I forgot the most about because I was spiralling so quickly out of control was my wife and my kids and my mates. I didn't think about them, so we need to check in with them. And this is a really important one, um, your wellbeing domains. So you've got your social, physical, self, emotional, intellectual, vocational, community, financial, all these um, wellbeing domains make up um, the spokes in a wheel that I call the unbreakable wheel of wellbeing. And the really important thing is with any wheel, well, especially a wheel with spokes, the spokes have got to all be balanced. They've all got to be the same length because if they're not, the wheel starts to wobble. Once it starts to wobble, it shakes and bounces and if you keep driving that wheel long enough, it'll eventually fall off. So there's a, real, a little exercise that you can do if you can do it once a week, once a, every couple of days, once a month. Sit down and, give, and um, you know, give yourself a score from one to five, one being terrible and five being excellent on these wellbeing domains and see how balanced your wheel is. And if it's not balanced, focus on the spokes that are the shortest and try and balance your wheel up. And it doesn't matter if every, every spoke's only a one, but balance those ones up. I really learned a, a real um, good lesson about this. I spoke at the Remand Centre in Melbourne to a group of prisoners. One of the prisoners came up to me afterwards and he had his arms like this. He had the biggest arms I've ever seen on a bloke in my life. He comes up to me, he goes, you know that exercise you said? He goes, physically, I'm a five. And I said, <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, do it, Freddie. He said, but physically, uh, socially, emotionally, he goes, I'm probably not even a one. He said, so I'm going to sit down now and probably put the weights away because I get out in two months and I never want to come back into this place again. He'd been in for 18 years and he was absolutely petrified of going outside. So he was going to work on those. So that's how powerful that exercise can be. Understand your values of, and what you live by. It's really important to understand what your values are. Acknowledge your support network. So apart from the unbreakable wheel of, of well-being, the most important thing I want you to take away today is understand who your five people are. Who are the five people that you love and you trust that you can have these conversations with? And they don't have to be friends. It can be professional people as well. And, it, and as long as you've got one person, it's good, but try and find who your five are and identify who they are and have conversations with them now before you need to have real serious conversations with them. So understand who those five people are. And I, I'm lucky, like I've got my wife, I've got five kids, so I'm lucky. But two very important parts of my support network are my dogs. We go for a walk every night. I can tell them anything I want to tell them. They look up and still love me. They don't judge me. They don't talk back, they just listen. So they're a really important part of my support network. Understand your non-negotiables. Um, what do you do for yourself? What are the things that you do for yourself? You know, is it fishing, is it golf, is it playing tennis? What do you do? What are the behaviours or what behaviours do those sort of things create? And still w acknowledging those domains. Third A is action. Control what you've got power over. One of my biggest lessons is, is I tried to control my silent business partner. My silent business partner was Mother Nature. I had no hope. The more I worked, the harder I worked, the more effort I put in, the more out of control my mental health got. So just control what you've got power over. And if it needs to be controlled and you haven't got the power over it, outsource it and get someone else to help you with it. Reach into that support network. Gratitude is really important, the who, the what and the why. Understand who you're grateful for, why, what you're grateful for and why. And be mindful. Now, it's really hard these days to be mindful, but be present and live in the moment. One of my strategies is just with my phone, when I go for a walk or if I'm sitting on the tractor or whatever and there's a sunrise, taking a sunrise or a sunset photo. That's a mindfulness strategy that I use. It's just five seconds or two minutes out of your day that you're just focusing on something that's totally not in your head. Um, focus on the small things and control what you control. I want to finish off with my three lessons. 
These are the three lessons from my, from my journey, my mental health journey, but they're universal and I've heard, the, the, heard applications for these lessons all through the talks today. My first one is communication is key. It's vitally, vital that we talk about stuff. It's vital that we talk about our stresses, our challenges, um, with our support network, with our people around us, our industry, whoever it is. The reason why it's my number one, if I take you back to that two feet of perspective moment, when I picked myself up off the floor of the dairy that night, I went home. I didn't actually tell my wife for three years what happened. And that was a big burden to carry. But the day that I told her, it was like a liberating experience. So communication is key. We need to stay connected. Staying connected to our community, to our support network, to our friends, our family. It's really important. Community is important and there's power in community. And community can be whatever you want. It can be a group like this. It can be your family, friends, sporting club. But the power in community is in the shared wisdom. And we've heard that up on the stage all day today. Sharing wisdom with the people around us creates answers to the, and solutions to the problems and the challenges that we're facing. So it's really important that we stay connected. And thirdly, seek support. And whether that's re regarding your mental health and well-being, your business, your relationships, whatever it is that you need help with, seek support. It's not a weakness to reach out and ask for support. So remember that, those three things, communication, connection and seeking help. And there's plenty of like help around and support, you know, the Lifeline does a wonderful job, you know, with crisis counselling with people that are, you know, that, are, that need help. And just recently I've done a fair bit of work with like rural aid and that, especially up here, like I've had lots of people ring me from the Lockyer Valley because I've actually spoken there a number of times before and how can we help you and I've directed them to these services. So like Rural Financial Counselling Service and Rural Aid and Lifeline and these people are there to help. Those organisations are there to help. So if you are struggling and you're facing challenges, reach out and get some help. It's been a real honour to be asked to come and speak here today and I really thank Ian for the opportunity. Um, you know, hopefully you'll take one thing away from my talk today or one thing's resonated with you but the one thing I really want you to take away is those five people. Understand who those five people are and connect with them. Make sure they know, you know that they're part of your support network and return the favour and be part of theirs. So thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.